Hi everybody and welcome to this session talking about life as a primary care network clinical director. My name is Anthony, I'm an ST3 GP trainee and I'm your host today. This series has been created to help answer some of those frequently asked questions that many of us get towards the end of our training. We're going to be joined by GPs from a range of different backgrounds to share their experiences and top tips across a range of subject areas. For today's session, we are joined by an incredible GP, Dr. Fazana Hussein. Fazana is a, a GP partner in Newham. She's a primary care network clinical director. She's co-chair of the National Primary Care Network. Network. Uh, you can correct me on the exact terminology of that. And um, most recently, you might recognise her from Piccadilly Circus in London, where her portrait was featured alongside a range of other key workers um, who've been contributing massively throughout the COVID-19 pandemic. She also won GP of the Year last year at the G General Practice Awards, and so we're really delighted to be joined by someone who's become one of the key faces of general practice at the minute. Hi Fazana, thanks for joining us. Anything else that you want to add to your introduction? Hello, Anthony. No, I'm just delighted to be here. Thank you so much. What an introduction, but I'm delighted to be here. And uh, it seems just yesterday I was a trainee. It was actually 19 years ago, but I'm really delighted to be able to share some of my uh, learning, if that's useful. Thank you. So I guess um, this session is all about being a primary care network clinical director. Um, for anyone who's not sure, what is a primary care network? Yeah, a really good question. So primary care networks were born just a year ago. We've just reached our first birthday and um, they're just a collection of practices um, that serve um, the, the, the community. So uh, a figure that's sort of written in the, in the long term plan is sort of 30 to 50,000, that sort of number of patients, but it can be bigger or smaller. Uh, nobody's been too prescriptive about that. So the network that I'm clinical director of in Newham Central One, we have 10 in our borough of Newham and uh, I just happen to be a clinical doctor of the largest we've got 67,000 residents that we're serving and that's made up of seven GP practices but there are some that are smaller some that are a bit larger. And obviously you've said that you're the clinical director um, for, a, for a network what does that what does that mean what does your role entail has that changed over the last year? I imagine it's it's kind of still a bit of a work in progress, perhaps in figuring out exactly what it what it involves. Yes, what an important question, because I'm still trying to figure that out as well. <laughs> and one of the fun bits of being a clinical director is, of course, because primary care networks are new, it's quite nice to be on that adventure and carve it out. But um, th there are certain things that sort of I, I, I do. So I represent the seven practices and, and it, across our seven practices, we're sort of 19 GP partners. And of course, our salaried GPs and our nurses and all, all the workforce that go along with that. So I, I, I represent them and I'm sort of the point of contact for uh, people like the CCG, our commissioners, when, when they want things um, delivered and if people want to come and talk to us. And, and most importantly, I'd like to think that, you know, we together represent our, our, our residents. And for me, as a GP partner, I work in quite a small practice. Uh, I'm a, a single-handed GP and I just look after 5,000 patients. And one of the nicest things about being part of a network is that extra support and those extra facilities that we can give our patients that you can't maybe do when you've only got a, a small list of 5,000. Mm. And um, so you mentioned obviously a number of practices have come together and you, you're kind of that key touchstone for delivering some of those goals for primary care networks. Over the last year what's that transition to becoming a clinical director been like? Have you learned new skills or learned new things about yourself in the process? Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, I think the biggest thing I've learned is how important relationships and trust are. It, they're two really small words, aren't they? But I think it, it's it's a real uh, big change to work from what I call as the sort of a little independent nuclear family to, to go into your wider network extended family. And it really has felt like a family. At times we've been, you know, at each other. It's quite hard for, for so many people to work together. Um, and at times it's been just absolutely fantastic and I think the key to that has been all of us having a shared purpose of what we're trying to achieve what are we trying to do keeping our patients at the center of that and um, also 
really trusting each other. So sometimes I've said things that uh, others have thought, what is she on about? But they've trusted me enough to think she might be able to get us there. But we've had certain things to deliver. So um, certain um, things, what we call direct enhanced services. So we get paid to deliver some services. And that's been quite transformational. So one of them is, uh, for example, how we look after the medication for our patients for structured medication reviews. And that's helped um, make it more safe and that's helped um, make our prescribing more efficient for our patients and that's just one of the certain things we've had to deliver so I think for me it's been about trust and relationships and um, also my own resilience thinking about when it looks a bit bleak because it's a new thing you know new things are hard when it looks a bit bleak you know, keep going I might have had to reach for that extra bar of chocolate but you know keep going it, because it turns out right in the end and um, in terms of kind of the balance of things at the minute, how does being a clinical director fit in with your with your other role as a GP partner? Do they kind of blend together at all? Is there very do you keep very set boundaries around the CD role, or is that just not possible? So, so again, really good question. That's been a challenge, Anthony, because although um, the, the the pay I, I do get paid for it's a paid role, and I get paid ten hours a, a week. Uh, but that's really flexible. So some weeks there's sort of twenty hours work to do. Just if there's so much going on, you're trying to embed something. For example, when our link worker and our pharmacist two new roles to the network started, there was a lot of embedding um, after the recruitment. And then some weeks you'll find that there aren't as many meetings. Uh, it has has been a, a, a challenge in terms of working flexibly but because I enjoy it um, I think it helps but it, it's not a nine-to-five role no it's not a nine-to-five role mm. and uh, you probably already kind of touched on the reasons why but when the CD roles started to become available what was it that kind of made you think this is something that I want to do um, what were kind of the key drivers towards that decision it was one really, it was my passion to improve care for my patients. Having been a GP for at that time nearly 18 years, I was constantly frustrated sitting in the consulting room. You know, um, uh, a patient, for example, who had um, hip pain, osteoarthritis of the hip and wanted to go to the physiotherapist. You know, the, the physiotherapy department is only under a mile away. Uh, you know, she got there, they didn't know who she was. She got turned back, that she got there for the second time. Oh, there was a cancellation, she couldn't be seen. And you know, if you didn't have hip pain before you started, you'd have hip pain afterwards. And I was really keen that we join up care because primary care and GP practice is a very important part, but only one part of our NHS. And I think primary care networks give us the ability, not just for practices to work together, which are, you know, I've alluded to better services for patients, but actually for us to be working with our community trusts, our mental health trusts, our voluntary sectors, our hospitals. And uh, that, that was the driver because I think it's a, a golden opportunity to provide good joined up care for our patients, which I sadly have failed at in the last 18 years. And since, since you've taken on the role, I know it's very, very early days. Have you started to see any of those benefits starting to take shape or kind of any early signs of ch positive change that you were looking for or hoping for from the role? already Anthony so one of the um, things that we had to deliver on as a network that everybody in the country had to deliver on as part of our QAF quality outcome framework which many of us will know about there was two quality improvement initiatives to do um, across the network and one of them was safer prescribing and monitoring of your high-risk medications like methotrexate uh, warfarin and to, to be able to deliver that across the network and to have one standardized way of doing it has undoubtedly improved care for our 67,000 patients not just 5,000 that that was really that that was a real success for me and that led to then more learning and sharing within the practices and I think my practices if I did ask them I think the thing that they would probably find most useful is that there's never been such an opportunity just to talk to each other and to learn from each other because sometimes it can be a bit isolating in our in our consulting rooms and you know our nurse colleagues and our admin colleagues say the same thing so um, I think that's been that's been a real success to be able to do that although we, we were supposed to do that we had to do that it was really beneficial for us as well as our patients. Hmm. I think I think yeah it obviously might have been a target but to actually be able to deliver something which can provide such meaningful improvements to patients over such a short time period is a is a massive achievement I think it must feel very gratifying to have been kind of leading over that process. Definitely. 
Um, before you became a clinical director, um, GP practices have been working together in some areas and collaborating for many years before um, PCNs became kind of an official thing. In your area, was there, were there already existing working relationships between practices or was this a very new process for working together? So the seven practices that came together and the reason we chose to be a slightly larger network is because for the seven years before that we had been coming together in what were commissioning clusters, so the CCG, um, we, we used to meet together in meetings and so we had a relationship but what's been really exciting for me is that that used to be a bit more passive in my view we used to sit and you know listen to what um, others were saying what I've loved about the network is that we're here delivering services for our patients because that's what we do in practice right that's what we're doing we're here to provide and um, so while the relationships were there I think they've got really strong this year because we, we are able to create and deliver things that matter to us and our patients. Mm. Yeah I think um, I've been having some other conversations as part of this series one was around at scale working which is in many ways kind of similar to the ambitions of um, primary care networks and the theme that kept coming up time and time again was all around relationships um, and kind of collaboration. And if you don't have those kind of human factors right to begin with, then it's very difficult to get things going. Um, so it sounds like that's it was good that you kind of already had some of those kind of foundations of relationships in place, which have then allowed you to kind of um, run rather than walk from the outset when your PCN got formed. Absolutely, I couldn't agree more. I mean, originally we were going to be two, we were going to be a four practice and, and the other three because of the because 67,000 we thought was quite large, but um, it was because of those relationships. The other three said, no, we want to be with you guys, you know, and, and that has got us through. So there's been some tough times, as I'm sure there has been for all networks and it's those relationships and trust that's got us through. Mm -hmm. And we've kind of touched on some potential challenges like um, kind of keeping boundaries between your work. Um, obviously, the role of a CD can um, expand hugely beyond the hours that you're actually paid for. What other kind of challenges have come over the last year with the CD role? I think the hardest one for me has been um, the new roles. So this year we've had a pharmacist and a link worker. And as we move forward, there's going to be 10 other roles. Um, it's called the ARSS scheme. And it's a bit of a different way of working, Anthony, because we're used to having staff in our practice. But across the network, there was a challenge of actually who's looking after our, our, our new, new colleagues. And because the link worker particularly is a non-clinical role and was a bit new to primary care, although it's been embedded in Council before um, we were all just learning together and I, I would say that the learning for us has been it was a bit of everybody's baby is nobody's baby so we weren't really sure who was looking after the link worker and who was also managing them and um, that caused quite a lot of confusion so we we had a good learning from there and thinking about really role clarity and who's responsible for what and I think we're in a much more successful position I hope going forward with all the new roles that are coming because I think they can be a, a real support to GPs. I'm very passionate about the new roles working but you know my network has been saying what are they going to do, who's going to look after them so those are the challenges sort of learning how to look after new roles, see how they can bring value and who's actually looking after them. Mm, yeah I think that's um, you know it's quite a daunting challenge in my head to have this very new role to the primary care but you know with so much potential behind it and then to be tasked with kind of making realizing some of the potential benefits of that person's role um that, yeah it does sound quite a daunting challenge to have to take on but one that when you get it right i'm sure you will get it right it sounds like it'll be incredibly rewarding for um other people working in your area and obviously patients as well I do, I do hope so, Anton, because I think it's really important that that person feels very much that, that they're in a team, going back to the trust and relationships, because of course we seven practices know each other and have for years, but to have someone new coming, it's really, it's, it's hard enough to be the new kid on the block, isn't it? And then to make sure they have their team and that they have their peer support as well. So one of the things we're doing, we're, we're thinking about having a first contact physiotherapist, but we're working with our community trust um, for that because they have other physios. So so at least that physiotherapist will have some 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 other physios we all like to have a bit of peer support don't we 
yeah definitely i think that's um something that obviously i found incredibly important throughout gp training is having that peer-to-peer -peer support um and you know anyone that's coming into the world of primary care is definitely going to be an essential aspect of their role as well to be able to have that um so yeah i think that's an important thing to think about for any of the new roles as you say that are coming through the system now um, the one thing that I wanted to touch on was your role as um, co-chair of the National PCN Network. What, how has that kind of process been? Um, what feel do you get for the kind of atmosphere and um, thoughts of other CDs working around the country at the minute? So I've been so delighted to be co-chair of the PCN Network as part of the NHS Confederation and we're a membership organisation and Confederation has acute trust and mental health trust and had CCGs um, but for the first time I'm pleased to say we got into primary care providers now so we are the primary care network and um, there's a very mixed feeling Anthony um, uh, uh, across the country so that the, the board that I uh, co-chair is made up of 14 of us and we're based sort of two per region so apart from being co-chair I'm responsible for London region along with uh, another CD uh, Graham who's a pharmacist actually we've got two pharmacist CDs and some nurse CDs and um, listening to the, the mood again very different 50% of our clinical directors across the country are in their first leadership role so you know if you're thinking about it any of you listening to this go for it you know because 50% are in their first leadership role, and then 50% uh, are a bit more dinosaur like I am and um, I, I think it's it's brought a real uh, wealth of, of, of talent actually and different perspectives um, some networks are, are struggling a bit more than others and I think the hardest part is for those practices to see the benefit of why they would want to work together as a network um, and I think the ones that are soaring are those that are really looking at you know what we call population health or you know the community's health and have already made those inroads in with community trusts and you know, because primary care networks are a bit bigger than just a bunch of general practices working together so we're real scale and I'm hoping that if I do my job correctly as co-chair that I'll be listening to as many CDs as I can with got 1250 networks in the country and then I'll be listening and they'll be taking that back and then we'll be talking to NHS England about that and, and helping to influence what our, our CDs want to need on the ground. Mm. I think that's that you know again sounds so important for you know an organizational structure which is so new and as you say lots of people taking on their first formal leadership role as a CD it's um I guess it's essential that they are listened to and they're supported as well is there any at the minute is there any specific support in place for people who have taken on a cd role any kind of like development opportunities um or anything like that at the minute so at the moment there's um there's a coaching offer that's free um from, from nhs england um and then locally most areas have got some leadership training um that that's funded um so there's different offers um the other thing i would say that's really good for cds that's often overlooked is the power of a network manager because otherwise there's a lot of um responsibility on that one cd and we need to remember that this is a team game so a network manager can be really useful and of course that the the assets in your network which again we haven't quite got to certainly in my network but you know, some of our nurses are absolutely fantastic um, our, our practice managers our admin so I, I would say that part of the support is for CDs and I'm telling myself as well that you don't have to do everything yourself you know look at people in your network who are really keen and, and could take on could take on the lead role I think that's I think that's really nice I think it was when he was going through the process of all of the CDs being recruited and I was seeing on Twitter and other places lots of um, kind of like we say people taking on their first leadership role it was it felt like a really an important time of change for them to be able to take on this responsibility but equally when you do take on that responsibility particularly if it might be your first leadership role I think there must be a huge sense of um, needing to deliver and perhaps doing that on your own so I think those reflections on actually letting go of some of that and finding other people who are skilled and talented and keen to be able to help on their leadership journey as well is a really I think important nice part of being a CD as well or at least I hope that is a part of it in the future as well. 
No, definitely. And, and I would advise, you know, don't wait as long as me to learn that because I used to find that quite hard. But actually, you know, there, there's no harm or shame in saying, actually, I'm, I'm not going to be able to do all this myself because I don't, I don't think you can, even if it was a full, full time role. And um, some of the things that we want to do in our PCN network through the CONFED is also um, if people want to, you know, email us, then we can buddy up as well. So, um, you know, and that's not just one sided. You know, I'm sure that the more people who've had more experience in leadership roles can learn a lot from the you know from the new cds but we would certainly want to um offer that you know a buddy system mm -hmm. and obviously we've spoken a lot about pcns being very new um, but already you're starting to see some positive ch um, positive impact because of their implementation if you were to think about kind of the next five years maybe longer for primary care networks what would you like to see in the future how would you like to see them continue to develop so I'd love to see the primary care networks almost behave like um, some 20% of the country are covered by primary care homes, which was a model that the National Association of Primary Care um, championed, which influenced the network. So it would be great to see, you know, you, you go into uh, a practice and there's your first contact physiotherapist there, there's an occupational therapist there, your paramedic might be doing some home visits, not on a practice basis, but on a network basis so that you know, people aren't waiting and that paramedic is very skilled at visiting so they're getting you know really good care from you know specialist um, lots and lots of work being done to improve like our mental health services so we're working with mental health lots and lots of joined up work just to provide that joined up NHS that our patients want and, and, and deserve really which I think hasn't always been there. Mm. Yeah I think from someone who's coming towards the end of my training it feels like a really exciting time and and primary care networks do have a huge amount of potential to realize some of those benefits we've spoken about during this conversation um so yeah I kind of echo what you say it would be great to see them continue to develop in the way you've said and to really be able to i guess deliver pet care in a really person-centered way which meets the the actual needs of our communities in a way that yeah as you say perhaps we haven't got quite right in the past sometimes I think you're right. I think for me, it's a bit of the best of both worlds. So I can still provide that personal care to my rather small list of 5,000 patients, and many of them I absolutely know. I've known for, for you know, 16 years. Uh, but but um, up until the primary care networks, I, I wasn't able to provide the, the range of services because I'm just not big enough. Uh, so to be able to get the best of both worlds and provide that, uh, and also to, to support our GPs because we know that we don't quite have enough GPs in the country and you know we've got fantastic advanced nurse practitioners and just to build on those roles those occupational therapists I've said those dietitians I think it's a real game changer I think if we get this right um, I know it's a change in mindset but I think our workforce our doctors will be happier and I think our patients will get good care so I'm really really excited about it even a year on as you can hear well, I think that's quite heartening and definitely you know, I'm, I'm very excited about primary care networks as well but listening to you talk is always quite inspiring to think about the potential impact they can have and it's great to hear some positive reflections about the first year and the impact that you're already having um, through your primary care network so thank you for sharing those. If um, you've kind of already touched on if trainees if there was the opportunity to become a, a clinical director for people who are um, kind of approaching that transition or have just entered first five was there any advice that you would give to them around thinking about taking on a role like that any top tips that you could give them um, I guess for any real leadership opportunity as well I would say go for it don't be scared um, when I took my first sort of named leadership role it, it was only four years ago I was a board director of our local GP federation that represented all 47 practices um, I had never really considered myself a leader I'd never thought about being a leader but actually anybody who wants to make change and who's positive you learn the skills as you go you probably all have a lot of skills actually you know if you're managing your patients you can see how your practice is working you're, it's all in there so I would say don't be afraid give it a go uh, I'm, I'm sure you'll enjoy it thank you I think those are yeah definitely key bits of advice that um, as you've said throughout training we've already gained loads of skills that we might not necessarily appreciate to be leadership skills but actually um, they can be applied to many other settings and many other roles as well and as you say not being afraid that you have to be the finished article but you can learn things on the job as well 
I guess the most important thing is having um, the kind of passion and drive and the why behind what you're applying for is um, always going to hopefully lead to you being successful in that role. That's it exactly, Anthony. Know your why, have some passion. You've said it better than me. And, uh, you know, I, I'm not sure there is a finished article. You know, like I'm learning all the time. You know, I've got a mentor now. Um, so it's it's really helpful to have that. Um, but, you know, you can just see so that, that there's no finished article. You're absolutely fine where you are. Give it a go. You're, you know, you're never too inexperienced. And, and I would say the passion that, you know, what, you know, I'm a GP trainer when I was training, RST3s have, you know, is re really hard to match when you're older. So you're probably in a better position. <laughs> I think that's one of the joys of not just general practice, probably all healthcare jobs is that constant learning and yeah, accepting that you don't have to be a finished product, but you can always love learning and learning um, new things, new skills, new things about yourself as well. So it's, um, you know, again, it's just really nice to hear that you've had such a positive experience on the whole over the last year, taking on a new challenge as well. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much for joining us, Fazana. I think that was a really interesting and exciting conversation. I'm feeling really positive about the future and um, wish you all the best for the next year of your PCN CD role as well. Um, thank you everybody for listening and tuning into this session. There's going to be plenty more in part of the series, so do make sure you check out those as well. And we'll see you next time. Thank you. Thank you.